I was able to run out and get another, get my external screen plugged in. So I'm, I'm not dealing with the problems of not being able to see my presenter notes and not being able to perceive, to see y'all uh, and, and do all that. So anyway, it's- it's all it the was, wonders of technology, Father Gary. <laughs> One, uh, it was a, it was it was a, a slightly challenging morning. Yeah, it, it's supposed to save you time, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh golly. Oh golly. So this morning we'll move into um, chapter three, um, but I did want to uh, bring something up um, from last week before we get started, and um, that is that. Uh, Borg's book appeals to a lot of folks, but not to everybody. And, um, and that's fine. And he would say that that's fine too. Um, yes, he would. Mm -hmm. and, and that this is, you know, we're, we're op op offering options um, for alternate ways of understanding how we relate to to Jesus, um, how we relate to God. And so there's no um, uh, sense, I, I, I want to make sure that there's no sense that Borg is right. He wouldn't even say so. He would just say, this is the way that he understands the material. Um, and, and so if, if you are, if there are challenges or things like that, please let me know. But again, know that this is uh, meant to sort of pardon the pun, flesh out. <laughs> um, no, don't pardon the pun. It was intended. Um, yeah, that's good. It's a good writing <laughs> term. Flesh out Jesus yeah. for us in some other ways. So um, with that aside, so in chapter three, um, he turns to um, what I thought was just a really, really um, wonderful way of looking at Jesus that uh, and Jesus' teachings that I had forgotten was in this book. I focused on some other things in my memory, and I'd forgotten this piece. But he, he devotes this, this chapter to compassion. Um, and uh, he notes that the Hebrew word, but also the Greek one, he doesn't, um, doesn't point to that in quite the same way, but the Hebrew word that gets translated compassion is plural, um, of a noun that when it's singular means womb, womb, don't you really like So compassion is really like both, um, a feeling and a way of being that flows out of that feeling, just like a womb is more than just an organ, it, it gives life. So he, he really wants to play with this idea uh, about um, compassion and womb Ness. Um, he uses some other words we'll get to in a minute. Um, and he points out that compassion means to feel with, that passion is that, that passio, that, that feeling thing in calm, the, the, the prefix means to feel with. So you're feeling the feelings of somebody in a visceral way, um, as he puts at a level below the head, um, this, this real way of, of being with somebody that is more than just um, head, head work. Um, and he points out, um, which, I, which I really appreciated, that compassion is not the same as mercy. That mercy implies a, a sort of superior or subordinate relationship. That the superior can have mercy on the subordinate, but it can't work the other way around. Whether as a subordinate can feel compassion for the superior. Um, which, which wouldn't necessarily be the same, um, you know, the, the same way that a, that a subordinate would, would address a uh, superior. And he, he paraphrases William Blake, um, mercy wears a human face and compassion a human heart. Um, that distinction between mercy and compassion. And I just thought that this was, this, this was a really good way to start all of this. And then he, he, he fleshes it out, uh, um, moving on to compassion, God, and ethics. Um, he points out that the Hebrew Bible frequently uh, speaks frequently of God as being compassionate. 
and have, having those resonances of womb um, close at hand. And so he says, uh, he points out that when Jesus says, be compassionate as God is compassionate, that that is rooted in Jewish tradition. And this is one of those echoes from Bishop Kim. You know, well, there were two sons. Oh, we know about two sons. <laughs> we know all those stories about two sons. So when Jesus says, be compassionate as God is compassionate, the, the, the Jewish audience would hear that um, in a very, very uh, concrete way. And he, he goes on to say that, to say that God is compassionate is to say that God is like a womb, that God is womb-like, or this other, this other word, uh, womish, uh, womish, um, which, you know, when you see it spelled, just doesn't work right, it, um, <laughs> but womish. So, um, and so he, he then plays with that image um, of womb-like or womish, and, and asks us, um, maybe not so much um, uh, outwardly, but inwardly, ask us to say, to play with this when we think about the word compassion. So he says, what does it suggest to say that God is womb-like? Well, womb, it gives birth. God gives birth. Um, God loves us like a mother, like that one who gives birth to us. Um, so there are these nuances of giving life, of nourishing, caring, perhaps embracing, and encompassing. So if we take those images and translate them into compassion, um, clearly that's a lot different than, than uh, an image of mercy um, and has all of those resonances that are really quite, quite fascinating. Well, and on, on top of that, Gary, you know, I grew up hearing that scripture translated, be ye perfect, as God is perfect. And oh man, that was a huge mantle to carry around. Yep. Reading it with yep. compassion, I mean, it's completely different. There's, there isn't the guilt of, of my humanity hanging on that scripture when it's right. translated that way. We right. were raised in something of a purity uh, society, that when you were pure, you were good. And I, I really have appreciated, Mike, your comment last week about, about eighth grade. We started to see things right. And I thought about, well, that's in the Jewish tradition when you have your bar mitzvah. And in my tradition, when you join the church and go through catechism class, and, uh, or at least you was. So I agree with you, Elaine, that it was a sense of being perfect and I, I just, I really love this chapter, Father Gary. Sorry, but I did love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, the whole question of be perfect, the, the Greek word is teleos. And um, at least in that, trans, in, in that particular instance, and there are a lot of debates over what teleos means. <laughs> and, Probably. Uh, and, and, and the issue of perfection, um, we, have, uh, we have ideas about what perfection means that teleos um, is, is greater than, that's for sure. And then he raises this, um, he goes back to the, to the issue of imitatio dei, the imitation of God. Um, and so if, if we are to be, and, and puts this into that issue of um, compassion. So to be compassionate as God is compassionate, that imitating God, God's compassion is that we, are, we imitate that through our compassion. Um, or to be like a womb, like God is a womb, or to feel as God feels, to act as God acts in a life-giving and nourishing way. All of these ways sort of fit into that imitatio dei thing. And, um, and so th that's how he ends this section. And I'm interested in um, what, if anything, then, um, what's new in this uh, discussion of Jesus and the, and the meaning of compassion? Well, for me, compassion well, I, associated with womb made that, okay. was very new, and I, um, I loved it. And the other thing it made me think about as I read through um, 
was George W. Bush's campaign motto of compassionate conservatism. And I thought, you know, it wasn't really explained very well, but as Borg explains it, it really could be something of a bridge connecting conservative with liberal. If we could do compassionate liberalism and compassionate um, conservatism, and for those of us who are in the middle, the moderates of the world, <laughs> we could do that. But I really appreciated that discussion because I thought, you know, George W. wasn't wrong, but we sure didn't understand him. We didn't understand what he was saying. We'll and, get back uh, to that. What else? Yeah. What, what did other people get out of this section? That has I, was, I was intrigued by the intertwining of compassion and the purity laws. Oh, God. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. I thought we would. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Was there any more in this discussion of compassion, imitatio dei, or womb-like, or anything like that, 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 that struck folks in new and striking ways? This, Jim, um, I think the thing that really struck me was when I read the God Loves You Like a Mother, and I was sitting last night watching my daughter. We had her and her two boys over here and, and for about 12 years Susan was all about me and then she got married and unfortunately she went through five miscarriages and was told she'd never have any children and then she had two boys she had one miscarriage between the two boys and watching her last night uh, in, in I would say in her compassion for her two boys uh, really hit that point home for me. It, 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 when you compare to where my daughter was and where she is today, it's like life changing. And I, I was just struck by that uh, as I remembered reading this and looking at it. Well, let's move on. So he Borg then starts talking about um, purity systems. Um, but he begins by saying that compassion um, was central to Jesus, but not to Jesus's social world. That Jesus was quite different than, than um, those uh, who surrounded him. And he points out that the center of that world was be holy as God is holy. Um, and that's a very different um, center than be compassionate as God is compassionate. And he claims that that distinction between holiness and compassion was um, at the root of the conflict in his ministry. Um, there were two very different social mm -hmm. visions. Mm -hmm. Social vision centered in holiness on one side versus a, 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 a social vision, vision centered in compassion. And that that um, sort of shows up all the time. And then he claims and he points out that for Jesus, compassion was the core value for life in community. It was a paradigm around which we structured community, what, what he would say, how we would structure community. And so therefore, <clears throat> every community is a polis um, from which political comes. The city, you know, is, is every community. So therefore, compassion for Jesus was political because it was how we structured, uh, we structure community. And so he, Borg goes on then to talk about how the purity system worked in the Jewish social world. Um, and he, he, he starts out by saying purity was political because it structured society into a purity system. So it wasn't just a religious thing, it structured society into a purity system. Um, and so therefore, he says, if it's a system built on holiness, which means being set apart, that's really what holy means is set apart, um, Israel had to be separate from anything that was unclean if they were going to be faithful to God. Um, and therefore it set up a map which indicated that there was a place for everything and everything was gonna be in its place. 
if that happens, then, you know, we know that we've got a holy system. And the everything and everything in its place includes people, things, times, and social groups. So certain things are unholy or impure, certain people are impure, certain times are impure, certain social groups are impure. And he says that there was a range, points out that there was a range from really, really, really pure people on one side to really, really, really impure people <laughs> on the other side. Um, and all of the way, and, and the goal, of course, is to be pure. So you want to move up, up that scale. <clears throat> and that purity was defined by birth at, at birth. You could be impure at birth, but also by your behavior. Um, and so, you know, this, this uh, triangle that I've got here uh, shows all sorts of various ways of, of, of defining that purity, that the ruler was really pure and the outlaws and criminals are really impure. Then you can work your way up. Um, citizens, aristocracy, ruling family, you know, male and female all have those kinds of things going on. Um, so the righteous were those who followed the purity system and the sinners were those who didn't. We heard about sinners this morning being compared to the righteous. Yeah. Uh, Bishop Kim's sermon. Um, yeah. She did, yep. Physical wholeness was attached to purity and lack of wholeness with impurity. So if you think about, um, remember back, if, if you had any familiarity with what kind of animals could be brought to be a sacrifice, they had to be whole. They had to be blemish-free. Yeah. Um, th this was all, uh, you know, this, they were pure animals. And anything that didn't have that was impure. Um, popular wisdom. Uh, equated wealth with God's favor. So if you were pure, you were wealthy, more likely to be wealthy. The poor would be impure because God was not smiling on them. So everything was put into this categorization of pure and impure, male and female, Jew, Gentile. Um, and so it created this world with very, very, very sharp social boundaries. And he, he then points out or argues that at the center of the purity system in the Jewish world was the temple and the priesthood. They were the arbiters and the exemplars, theoretically, uh, of, of the purity system. And because um, if you were coming in to offer something pure, there were economic interests because, you know, Jesus overturns um, temp, uh, tables and things like that because you had to be able to come in with a pure offering. If you couldn't get one, hey, they had them for sale right there. Uh, you know, so there was an economic interest in all of this as well as religious. So it was really an all-encompassing um, uh, well, to use the word that he already used, an all-encompassing paradigm for how you structure how that world was structured. And so the politics behind that was bound up with the ideology of the dominant elites, the religious, the political, and the economic elites. They had every uh, uh, interest in maintaining this system because it worked to their advantage in one way or another. Um, and so you see that um, when you see the people who are arguing against Jesus, right? They're arguing about issues that, that threaten them, purity issues that threaten them. And then he ends by, by pointing out that it was central to two subgroups in Judaism in Jesus's times. The Pharisees, who, you know, you know all these arguments that Jesus was having with them. Why, why aren't you washing the outside of the cups? Uh, you know, all these kinds of, we got to keep this stuff clean, purity in everyday life. And then he also points out this group that we don't really see much in the Bible, but we know were, were there in Jesus's time, the Essenes or the Dead Sea uh, the folks that were out at the Dead Sea, they knew that they couldn't be pure in everyday life. The only way to do it was to get out, to get out of all of the messiness that was Jerusalem or Sepphoris or any of these other places and establish its own culture, all based on purity. And we know that that was the case from the writings that we have found of, of the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and other writings um, indicative of that group. So this system just kind of overrode everything um, in the world into which Jesus was born. 
Any thoughts or questions, or what do you make of that notion uh, of purity being political? I don't want to dominate, but <laughs> I'm gonna, I immediately thought of the Puritans who were so um, focused on purifying the English church of all Catholic uh, practices that they became known as the Puritans. And um, in the new world, um, they wanted, I think, to be compassionate, but Bradford's, uh, well, it's really a letter, kind of a sermon to younger generations about the plan um, plantation of, um, he talks about the treatment of the Indians and I'm sure in his mind it was compassionate, but it certainly wasn't in the minds of the Indians. Sure. And um, so I think America's had this thing with purity and it's often connected to capitalism. I also love the discussion on the emphasis on the individual versus the community. So, um, and in terms of separation, I thought of the Shakers, the Amish, the Mennonites, separating themselves out so they didn't have to deal with anybody else because they wanted to remain pure. It's okay. a really under, undercurrent still in the United States to remain pure. So that's what really hit me. Other thoughts? What hit me is that it feels like... Um... <laughs> Uh, undercurrent that has been used to separate people time and again in very terrible ways, right? Like in Hitler's Germany, you needed to be pure Aryan. And if you were not, in all of the ways listed by board here, whether it was physically or mentally or by birth or by religion, you were unpure and therefore to be put outside the system. Um, not even to be allowed to live <laughs> in that scenario. But I think you hear it, an echo of it, in the language that is used often when people are talking about people who are immigrants, that they are dirty, that they are bringing disease, that they are, you know, going to be polluting our country in some way, shape, or form. And that's gone back to you know earliest immigration waves where that was definitely the the story that was told and um and i just think it perpetuates itself over and over again and i think we see this tension between people who want purity and people who want compassion or people who are speaking from a place of purity and compassion i mean there's so much about the racial I, I, country and people saying, you know, again, associating dark skin with being dirty, et cetera. I think, I think, I think it just continues to run through. Diane, do you want to say something? Guess I not. was going to say something, but she was finishing. I thought oh, she was done. So go, go ahead. ahead. No, I finished. Thank you. Go ahead, Diane. Okay, I was just I was just saying that um, purity is cleanliness, and cleanliness is related to goodness and God. That's part of that's part of this teaching. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I I think in some ways though, it's. It's a domination, whitewash to be called purity. <laughs> or a desire for domination that's been whitewashed to become more accessible and less abhorrent. Well, to take that a step further, I think there's a lot of condemnation of those who are seen as being unclean or impure. And that's, yeah. a, that's the whole flip side of that is the looking down on or they're unworthy of our compassion or anything else because they're not 
doing what we think they need to be doing to be pure. Well, and, and I think that's a hallmark of examination. You know, I need to be on the top rung, so I'm going to step on the person below me to make sure that I stay on the top rung. Yeah. So Jesus, um, or goes on to um, point out uh, or describe Jesus' attack um, on the purity system. Um, and he, he, Borg says that, you know, that Jesus offered a different vision for how we structure com uh, community. It's a community shaped <clears throat> not by the ethos and politics of purity, but by the ethos and politics of compassion. And so he replaced uh, the core value of imitatio dei that had been holiness with compassion. And um, he, uh, Borg, um, elucidated all or gave gave all sorts of examples of of this critique, um, telling the the uh, the Pharisees that they tithe mint and cumin, but neglect justice, that that they're so concerned about doing that right thing with these itty bitty things, but they ignore the bigger thing. He characterizes them as unmarked graves, and then points out that of course, being close to death was. <laughs> It made you impure. It wasn't just saying, you know, that you're dead, but you're also impure. That's a real pointed um, uh, a, a attack. Um, the purity on the inside, uh, he point, Jesus argues for purity on the inside is more important than that on the outside. And then, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, not in action, um, you know, not in your clean hands, but your heart. Um, he are, uh, says that the, and, you know, this is easily explained, the parable of the Good Samaritan is all about purity. You've got the, 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 these two uh, exemplars of, of the purity system who won't have anything to do with this poor man because they're so afraid of being made impure. By, by touching him. Um, and he points out that, you know, Jesus had these healing stories, um, shattering the purity boundaries of the social world. He touched lepers, which would make him impure. He touched corpses, which would make him impure. He entered a graveyard where there was this guy who lived among the tombs, making him impure. He wasn't interested so much in maintaining that system, but going where people were hurting. Um, and, and addressing those things. Um, and then, of course, who did he eat with? Who did Jesus ask to have dinner with? It was all of these people that, um, that were impure, right? The sinners and the prostitutes, as we heard this morning, um, the tax collectors, all of those folks um, who were um, impure. But Jesus had no problem sitting down at table with them. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things where he cast a new vision. He said, this is my table, you know, where everybody's welcome. You know, it, it's not about purity. It's about creating commu uh, a communion based on compassion. And so his inclusiveness, Borg goes on to say, really embodied a radically alternative social vision, um, uh, including his inclusion of women that, that was deeply, Borg argued, deeply threatening to the system. Uh -huh. Women, part of the discipleship of the equals, that <clears throat> really begins to threaten the system as well. So it, he ends the section um, pretty much by saying that Jesus' idea of the imitatio dei, of be compassionate as I am compassionate, was boundary shattering. Um, and, and he said that where, whereas he ends by saying, whereas purity divides and excludes compassion unites and includes. It, it struck me on that triangle that you had um, on earlier slide where the men were on one side and the women were the other side. I, I was looking in the inside of the um, triangle to see where women would fit in. And they don't fit into purity uh, until at least aristocracy because all the citizens were men. Yeah. No, no, they'll never, make it, all, they'll they're never they're make it all the way. Sorry? I, I, I'm sorry, but most, most of you on this, on this class will never make it all the way to purity. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, you know, I just thought it was ironic that, you know, 
Um, maybe they would fit in in the aristocracy, probably the ruling family, but nowhere belong that. And so, and so for Jesus to, um, to include women, you know, was, was bigger than we remember that it's big, given that, you know, we have some degree of, of um, inclusion now. Does that add to the selection of a word that means womb? <laughs> I mean, is, is the selection of a word that means womb as what we should be turning to a definite yep. acknowledgement that women are at the core and should not be separated out? Yeah. I was struck also by um, the description of the table and wrote a little note to myself about um, people feeling they cannot celebrate communion. Very dear friends of ours uh, came to Wally's funeral and they are devout Catholics and Elaine asked uh, Bishop Winter Road, if they could have communion, and he said yes. And that was really important. That was really, really important. And I, I, I just thought, yeah, Jesus didn't turn anybody away from the communion table because they were in the wrong church. <laughs> and yet, it still happens, and it can happen in Protestant churches. Yep. So, um, I, that, I just, I really gave me that thought. Anything you want to say about the significance of Jesus' attack on the purity system? Yes, Father. Um, you know, if you think we're in the Gilded Age now or heading toward that way, in the time of Christ, probably 100 people had 99.9% .9 of the wealth. Yes. And so they were, fight he was, when he was there and given his faith and the tenets of it, he really believed it was a beautiful faith and it should be followed and that the way they, the uh, divergence of the faith of the Jewish faith to this point system, the more points you got, the higher you got and the closer you got to God. We always think of the uh, Pharisee and the scribe sermon. And, he, I, you know, Jesus said, wait a minute, wait a minute. We, we've got a good thing going here, but you're going the wrong way. Of course, that didn't go over too well with the chief scribes and the elders because he was telling them, you got to change. You got to redistribute the wealth better. You got to do this better. You got to include better. So he was always this rebel making noise for a system that they thought was pretty good, even though it was under Roman rule and they were selling their souls every day to the Roman taxation system. So he had this. Uh, belief and uh, teachings of love and forgiveness and understanding and compassion. And he tells that again and again and again. And, and it's, it's really sad that uh, he shows us uh, if you truly believe in your faith, there are going to be sacrifices made. And comparable for what we would say today, he would come to us and say, hey, Mike, you don't need two cars. Your house is too big. Get rid of your clothes. Yeah. You know, there should be six people in your house instead of just the two of you. What the <laughs> hell? Is that? That's oh, kind of what the faith is. You know, it says, yeah. "Are you doing these things? Are you thinking about yeah. these things? Are you trying to address them? Why is there? So, why is you know, twenty-eight percent of your people go to bed hungry in this country of yours? What the heck are you doing? Well, a, hold, hold no that thought. Like that they didn't there. like it at all. We'll get there. Um, mindful of time. So he, he, he turns it to us, just as, as you already did there, Mike. He, he turns the issue of compassion to us. And he um, points out um, that the battle between, Jew, the, between Jesus and, this ad, and the advocates of the uh, purity system um, was a battle between two different ways of interpreting scripture, two lenses through which you can read the Bible, um, or a battle about the shape of the world. And we see that battle all the time. There are similarities um, in our world with questions of, of purity. And of course, Borg wrote his book in the late 90s, and some of the things that he brings up um, aren't as, uh, in quite the same way 
um, shaping us as they as they were in the 90s. But it's it's not hard to see similar um, similar questions. And he points out, you know, for example, rewards for culturally valued forms of achievement. Um, yes. Yeah. Failure to live up to those standards. I mean, you can think about this with our our our, our cult of celebrity. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if, if you've made it to a certain, or our cult, uh, cults around um, athletes, or, uh, you know, activity, physical activity. Well, if you don't, if you don't exercise, you know, seven times a week, then you just aren't cool. Uh, I mean, we do this in so many ways. Um, and, and so these sharp boundaries, you know, and I don't think that any of us are immune from that. I think we all do that in all sorts of different ways that if we sit back and think about it are, are kind of embarrassing. Um, yeah. I know that, that I am, um, uh, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, I don't want to go too far into self revelation here, but I have my issues too <laughs> um, about some of these. So the, the, these boundaries are what Jesus came. He would, um, what, what Borg points out, these boundaries are what Jesus came to do. He relates a boundary shattering experience of spirit and the boundary shattering ethos of compassion. He closes, he says, spirit and compassion grow, go together and that growth in compassion is a sign of growth in the life of the spirit. So he does draw these parallels. We've talked a, a little bit about them already. Um, are, are there other similarities that you can think of? And I just threw up this purity ring for, for those of you for whom that makes some uh, um, resonances. Are well, as I said earlier, we're dealing with it in politics. You're pure if you believe this and you're not pure if you believe that. And it, there's just two, um, unfortunately, camps that are working against this. So, yeah. I see that. Okay. What else? Somebody else. I wonder if we're wired for it because of evolution, that uh, oh. tribalism has always been very important to the survival of, of early humans. And uh, to some extent, I think that memory carries over from one generation to another in RNA. And so it may be something that we have to always fight against uh, because as Bishop Kim was saying, there's a difference here between you know how we view the world and what we can do to best protect ourselves is to concentrate or focus on passion and justice that's my thought i think it's a good thought for me it always comes back to a concept of abundance and scarcity and if if God is abundant, if his love is abundant, then the artificial constraints are irrelevant. The artificial constraints are placed because people find that, feel that God's love is scarce and they need to push others, as someone said, push others down so that they can be at the top to receive the love. Anyone else? I thought it was interesting when Bishop Kim first came in, the first retreat that she had, one of the first retreats she had was with the uh, standing committee and we did a three-day retreat on racism. And on that retreat, we talked about a lot about white supremacy. And I had never thought about it the way it was discussed on that retreat. And so my initial reaction was, well, that must be all the other people out there that are white. It certainly didn't apply to me. And over the last couple of years since that retreat, I've thought a lot about that. And uh, without, I, I, you know, I, as Gary said, we all have faults, and uh, I think I have probably fallen into the white supremacy with not, without meaning to, and uh, it's, it's made me think a lot, and I think that's, the reason I say that is because I think that's the difference between the purity system and what Jesus was trying to do, and it makes you reflect on where, where are you personally. 
So with about five minutes left, what does politics of compassion look like to you? What would it look like? Encompassing, complete, wholesome, true Christianity, that, that Jesus train that says you have to love as much as possible and to forgive and not justify. Unfortunately, when you're a Christian, you tend to be 90% pontificating and 10% faith practice. He'd like to see that percentage maybe be 50-50 and you'd be very happy. I think it's um, good to remember as Gore does towards the end of the chapter when he's comparing uh, Paul using love and um, using the word love and then in the love uh, chapter of um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so forth. Um, it's a different spirit. So as Christians, we'll have naturally more of the fruit of the spirit as we spend time with Christ. It's not just a commandment. It's not a commandment that you just sort of do like washing your hands or holding a position of some sort in a um, NGO, but it, it really originates with our relationship with Christ. And when I think about Christians wanting with politics these days, it doesn't seem to look like that. Focus on the fruit of the spirit. Anyone else? It's a ponderable, um, I think, um, is, you know, what does, what does that look like? What would a politics of compassion look like? Um, I thought too of, uh, of, you know, compassionate conservatism and what was the, what was the politics of saying compassionate conservatism as opposed to the politics of being a compassionate conservative? Um, what's the politics of saying compassionate liberalism as opposed to the, how one does that? I think that, you know, that's, that's really sort of where this hits us is. And, and again, you know, Borg's pointing out that if, if Jesus is challenging us to be compassionate as God is compassionate, um, we're going to deal. We're not. We're not going to necessarily deal well with a with a purity system that exists around us. Um, in, in in I mean, he didn't change it because <laughs> we're still living with it, even though after you know thousands of years, many people have claimed to be followers of Christ. So, uh, you know, it becomes our our task to follow um, follow Jesus into that into that political arena. Of, of being compassionate um, and, and modeling that kind of a world as opposed to just adopting the one that was given to us. I think compassionate conservatism and compassionate liberalism means listen to the other side, weigh both sides before you make your final decision. And, and be willing to compromise, I think. Yes. I can't okay. help but, but think of a person who was not a Christian, but rather a Jew, who um, really did more a great deal in her lifetime to um, embody com compassion in her um rulings from the Supreme Court and in the cases that she um, took before she was um, a, ju a justice, um, and that's Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her um, concern for an egalitarian culture. Um, it kind of takes it out of the Christian, not Christian divisiveness. Um, right. She was maybe more Christian than a lot of other um, Christians. <laughs> right. 
Thank you. Well, it's 11 o'clock. I wish you all a good week. Um, I, it's, don't pay any attention to the slide there because it's wrong. We'll read chapter four. Um, I, I didn't go all the way through this deck when I had a book in hand. So um, anyway, we'll do chapter four next week. Look forward to um, seeing you all. If you've got any questions, um, let me know. But thank you for a good discussion. And go out and be compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks.